Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you all. My name's Joy Carter, I'm the Vice-Chancellor. It's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to this really special event. This university has been delivering values-driven higher education in Winchester for 178 years. So we've actually got quite a group of amazing alumni. And this evening is all about one of them. Dirk came to study here in 1974, and he was doing a Bachelor of Education drama degree. I can't resist telling you we are still offset outstanding in teacher education. <laughs> One of the few universities in this country still to retain that, and we've just been inspected, so we're terribly proud of it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so we've produced lots of wonderful teachers over nearly 200 years, but not all those who study to become teachers choose to become teachers. Dirk himself once said this, School practice showed me I could never become a teacher, so I applied to the BBC to become a trainee studio manager instead. What a career-defining move that was. So Dirk embarked on a career that's seen him breaking new ground in spoken word audio. And he's had the chance to work with what feels like a list of every famous actor you could possibly think of. And here's just a few of them. Christopher Lee, Leslie Nielsen, Christian Slater, Rowan Atkinson, Hugh Laurie, Stephen Fry, Joanna Lumley, Jim Broadbent, Benedict Cumberbatch, Spike Milligan, and our very own honorary doctor, Miriam Margulies. What a collection. In 2004, Dirk directed, adapted, and co-produced two new series for Radio 4 of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And you probably know that the book turns 40 this year. There's all sorts of celebrations planned, and one thing that's happening is it's returning to Radio 4 this spring with a new series directed by Dirk and featuring many of the original cast members. That's fantastic. You won't be surprised to learn that Dirk's groundbreaking work has won him numerous national and international awards. Um, here's a few of them. So in the UK, the Sony Awards and Talkie Awards. In the USA, Audiophile Golden Earphones Awards. That's what they're really called. A Mark Time Lifetime Achievement Award and a New York Festival's Gold Medal. And I'm sure I've missed lots of them out. He was among the first ever nominees for the Director's Guild Award. This is for outstanding achievement in the field of audio theatre. What does he do outside this amazing career? Do you have time for anything? Well, he does. Dirk plays drums in various blues bands. And he lives here in Winchester with his wife and three sons. Dirk, it's really exciting to have you here with us this evening. Thank you so much for coming. I'm also delighted to welcome someone else, Mark Byford. Mark is our friend and one of the university's governors. And you'll probably all know that he's an award-winning journalist himself and former Deputy Director General of the BBC. So you're the perfect man for the job this evening. Thank you for coming as well. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's really tempting to ask you all to shut your eyes and imagine you're listening to a radio interview in honour of Dirk's work, but I won't, because instead I ask you to join me in welcoming, in person, Dirk Maggs and Mark Byford. Thank you, Joy. So good evening everybody, thanks very much for coming. I thought, as we're going to speak a lot about radio tonight, let's look at a video. <laughs> and uh, we're going to start with having a look at some of the work of Dirk in action. Please. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy radio show, live by Douglas Adams. What the hell's that? The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Oh, that thing. Oh, 
Oh, no. says out. What? Ow! The guys just want to get a great, very quick snap. So while they're doing that, and instructing him, let me just say, John is uh, John Lloyd's going to introduce the evening. It is a truth universally acknowledged that nobody likes the Vogons. As soon as he hits Sam, Sam's going to come off Mark, you come off Sam. Right. Okay. Call the first witness! Call the second 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 Four minutes twenty-three under sum, which is with laughs. That's right. yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. sorted. Let the magic, let the magic descend. Let the magic descend. Ah. Run the tape, Dee, quick. No, it's funny. Some days it, it, you end up feeling that you've really worn yourself into a frazzle, and you can't play back in your mind. You need to go home and actually listen to it and think, oh yeah, that was actually really, really good. That was great. Uh, I'm gonna go again. Yes, sir. <laughs> After six years, I've decided that all right. <laughs> Ten billion logic functions, maybe more. They make me take the paper off the floor. Sounds, sounds promising. It's not very similitude, it's almost similitude. The less to go wrong, the better. Yeah. Yes, yes it is. Kind of silent, like, like, what am I doing here? Kind of. But, thanks, mate. <laughs> thanks, guys. Thank you, a terrific job. Fantastic. Right, come on, you lot, we've got to get out. <clears throat> we are never doing that again. <laughs> Should go to a slide, but it doesn't seem to want to, so. Guinness. It's not there, but who cares? Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Joy said, it's 40 years since the uh, first series of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy hit the airwaves, March 1978, and it's returned uh, this month for a sixth series, uh, Hexagonal Place. The first thing, Dirk, is what is the appeal of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Um... That's interesting because there's a wide variety of opinion. I have irritated emails from people who think that Peter Jones should be resurrected or nothing should ever be done again. Uh, but I also, when we were doing the stage tour, some of the clips you saw there, I was seeing 10-year-old kids dressed in dressing gowns with towels who'd come to see the show, falling about with laughter at stuff that there was no way they could have come across before. And I think the thing about it is that Douglas was some kind, and I don't use the word lightly, of a genius. Mm. I think he had a creative, he had a, a slightly warped creative synergy of comedy and science and philosophy and the mixture of the three things in something which originally he just sold as a science fiction comedy, but somehow along the way, he created this thing which has become a sort of, uh, I don't know, I've been told by people that they kind of live their lives according <laughs> to the philosophy of basically if it's bureaucracy, it's going to screw up. So the interesting thing is I just walked in quite genuinely, David Simkin from P.G. Wells said it's the first time that all the books sold out even before the event has begun. I know, and I'd like you to know that Owen gets all that money, I don't see a penny. <laughs> <laughs> so in this new series, you know, we have Simon Jones back as Arthur Dent, we have Geoffrey McGiven back as Ford Prefect, and there's some new work from Douglas himself. How did you access that? Well, um, uh, And Another Thing was published in 2009, and the BBC uh, very quickly turned it into a book at bedtime, which is, you know, kudos to them. So uh, when it came to the 40th anniversary and the chance of putting on the hexagonal phase, which is our... Uh, adaptation of Owen's work, I felt it would be redundant to try and redo something that or had already been done. Mm. And because I knew, I, I, when I was in the late 2000s adapting uh, Douglas's Dirk Gently books for adaptation, we were talking about the third book, which was The Salmon of Doubt, which was 
never finished by Douglas and exists in a series of notes. And Douglas's brother James had given me uh, Douglas's, the contents of Douglas's hard drive, which was, you know, really interesting. Mm. Um, if only I'd known his bank account number <laughs> in 1988. But, um, but in amongst all of that was a lot of material that obviously had never made it into the Hitchhiker books. And it seemed to me that the, the best way to go about um, creating a new Hitchhiker series, which would celebrate the 40th anniversary, but at the same time be canonical with the previous series, would be to fold in, like, like cooking a, a cake, to fold in as much of, a, of Douglas's unpublished work as I could. And so Kevin Davis, who incidentally videoed a lot of the stuff on the video, went to University, uh, St. John's College University Library at Cambridge and went through all Douglas's papers. And because Kevin is very good at knowing what's been out there and what hasn't, he actually dug out this material. And uh, it was really useful. And if you see the scripts, we ended up with six scripts which had um, big blocks of bold type, which, was, which were bits by Douglas that no one was allowed to touch. <laughs> and poor Owen, anything by Owen, you could play with a bit, but anything by Douglas, no. Now, the pre-publicity for the radio series was incredible. I mean, I read one uh, comment that for radio, the return of Hitchhikers was like Blue Planet last year for television. I mean, there was publicity here, there and everywhere. Did you feel that excitement for the sixth series? You say excitement, but I'd say no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, yes, uh, it was interesting. I had a conversation earlier with somebody about this and um, I, John Lloyd and I were talking on uh, Front Row last week about this and John, I asked John if he would help me adapt, the, uh, help me adapt Owen's book um, along with Douglas's stuff, because I felt I wanted someone's hand to hold, because Douglas is no longer there, and I have a sort of ghostly Douglas that I, I summon up in mentally mm. when I write a particularly bad joke. Ford, focus. <laughs> <laughs> Please. I, I'm not proud. I'm not proud. Um, uh, that's when I sort of wished Douglas was actually there to talk to, and I thought John would be a very good substitute, given he wrote the last third of the first series, effectively. Yeah. However, um, uh, we are where we are. And when I did the third, fourth, and fifth series, I had to put my hat on as a, an ex-senior Radio Light Entertainment BBC producer and say, if it isn't funny, cut it. If it doesn't help tell the story, don't use it. And I had to be very uh, ruthless about it, as if I, Douglas was a neophyte writer bringing me something and I was the guy who was responsible for putting it on the air. The, so I was able to divorce myself from how important the material was and just look at it as an objective piece of work. That said, it was still very hard to do. For the new series, the real challenge is, and actually has been previously, the first two Hitchhiker series, particularly the first one, was broadcast at 10.30 at night. Mm. No one expected it to be a success. And we were just automatically given the 6.30 p.m. slot, the funny slot on Radio 4. That is enormously more pressure than any yeah. amount of working with Douglas's material. Yeah. It has to still be funny and make people laugh as they're driving home in their car and they're sitting in a traffic jam on the M40 heading out of London and they want to murder everybody. And you've still <laughs> got to make them laugh. So, six series. Let's hear a clip. Service. Eddie, engage the dogmatic program. There are death beams everywhere, and I'd like to be breathing ten minutes from now. Sure, Doc. I know how important breathing is to you. I look on you like family. You know that. Oops! Looks like there's not a lot I can do. Should I sing? Oh, when? No, do not sing. Get us to safety. Hmm. Just slide yourself in. I forgot about these stupid doors. Are they getting worse? Ah. <sighs> Please enter me from any direction. Yes, they're getting worse. Seyfard, we have to get out of here. Hey guys, great to have you back and all, but you ought to know when the path of six converging death beams and my diagrammatic algorithm has just overloaded. So, I'll be shutting down for the next, oh, I don't know, few hours or so. What? Shutting down. Wonderful. So that first series, if we go back to 78, Dirk, 
Let's have a think. It's, you know, the end of the Earth, destruction by the Vulcans. It's making way for that intergalactic bypass. Even God killed off. What, you know, when you look back at that first series, what was your first impressions? My very first impression when I was, uh, I was applying to join the BBC and I was here at King Alfred's College as it was at the time um, and doing a lot of stuff in the theatre here was, oh, Doctor Who with jokes, I'll nip down the Union Bar and sink a couple of pints instead. <laughs> Actually, no, at 10.30 at night I probably wouldn't have thought that, but anyway, <laughs> uh, something along those lines. And then I applied to join the BBC and got in and the instructors from day one were all about this new comedy programme that was in stereo, which was unheard of for comedy. All previous comedies were in mono. Um, and, and how the Radiophonic Workshop were doing the sound effects and how it was completely rewriting the rules of both science fiction writing and comedy and all of this. And I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then later that year, when I was doing my training, we had to do three months at Broadcasting House and three months at Bush House, which is the World Service. In the World Service, you do night shifts because as, because Mark used to run it. Um, in the World Service, you do night shifts and you're stuck in newsroom all night. Around about four in the morning, not a lot happens in the world. Well, not in those days. Now it happens everywhere all the time. Um, but in those days, it didn't. And so there was a tape. There was a, 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 a shelf full of stuff. And it was like fun tapes, all the bloopers of the year and so on. But somebody put hitchhikers up, a little row of seven-inch pale blue boxes. And so I would sit there and listen to it. And when I was listening to it, within the first two episodes, I suddenly realised, holy smoke, this is way beyond Doctor Who with jokes. So how much was it, do you think, that it came a year after Star Wars and the cult of that and the, you know, that was a game changer in itself? Or was it just that Hitchhikers itself was freestanding and was creating its own cult? Did the two have a relationship? Absolutely they did. Absolutely. John Lloyd took, uh, Don Lloyd and Douglas and I think Lisa Braun, who, uh, who became Jeffrey Perkins' wife, went to see Star Wars. And Douglas came out absolutely buzzing because science fiction, from being this sort of niche thing, uh, you know, had become this mainstream thing. And he was trying to sell a comedy series to the BBC at the time. And I'm not saying that it was straightforward at that point, but it's suddenly the possibilities were opened up by Star Wars. I think it worked. Any of us who were in the creative, who wanted either to be creative or who were already in the creative industries at that time, had all our horizons just completely pushed back by Star Wars. For all that it's now a box office filling, Disney possessed thing, mind you, so is Hitchhiker. Yeah. Um, uh, they're hoovering up the world. Uh, but the point is that it just changed everything. And Douglas came out lifted by it. He came out inspired by it. So absolutely, uh, George Lucas has a lot to answer for. Just listen to these statistics, Dirk, because they are incredible. 15 million books sold in 30 languages. 10 more tonight. <laughs> <laughs> a TV series. Five radio series until this year. Disney film, as you say, with Martin Freeman. You taking it on the road across the United Kingdom as a stage show. 35,000 people saw it the first tour. Is it a cult or is it something of mass appeal? Well, um, when we put the show on at the Mayflower Southampton, Douglas's mum came to see the show, Jan with uh, her daughter uh, Jane, Douglas's stepsister. And she came in, and the foyer was fu full of people wearing dressing gowns and carrying towels. <laughs> and, uh, and I went to meet them from backstage, because I played drums in the band, because I wasn't going to miss a minute of what happened on tour. It was just too much fun. And I went down uh, to the foyer, and are you OK, Jan? And yes, I'm fine, but I, all these people dressed up like this, it's like a cult. <laughs> And I said, well, yeah, but it's the most, it is, it is in a way, but it's the most benign cult you've ever <laughs> experienced because they all love your son's work. And she said, well, I have to tell you, 
um, Douglas's stepfather and I used to listen to the series at 10.30 at night, and we would fall asleep by the end of it because we didn't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, no, this is a two-hour show. So I said, I tell you what, why don't you go in, go in with Jane, and if you're really not happy, if, if I don't see you at the end of the show, I understand totally. You know, and you can imagine what happened, which is, in fact, Jane was texting me through the show, which, of course, I couldn't pick up because I was on the stage, but <laughs> I went up to grab a glass of water afterwards, and on my phone were three texts, and the first one was, Mum's loving the, the overture with the band. She says, Douglas would have loved this. The second one, uh, Mum is loving the joke, she's laughing away, and the third one was, Mum is standing and clapping. So I thought, <laughs> okay, fine. When we got to the end of the show, we went to the pub. I'll, I'll make it quick. And we got to the pub, and um, she came up to me, and she just went woof on my face. I had a really hard slap on both cheeks. And I, I said, look, if you didn't like it, you could have just gone home. And she, and she meant to do it in a friendly way. And she said, no, no, no. I never realized how funny Douglas was. Mm. But everybody was laughing. Now, you said, Dirk, there that Douglas would have loved it. And, of course, he died tragically age 49, in 2001. So with such a, an iconic brand as Hitchhikers, and him not being with us for many years now, how much of a challenge is it for you to keep the integrity of Douglas Adams? Do you, when you're putting together those series, feel, I've got to keep the faith here? Or do you feel you've got licence to develop? I never do anything that I think Douglas would have a serious problem with. I, when he, um, Douglas asked me to do it, I would never for a minute suggest I should do it without the fact that Douglas thought I could do it. And when he thought I could do it, and I went round to uh, Duncan Terrace in Islington where he lived and spent several long afternoons with him going through how we might turn um, Life, the Universe and Everything, the third book, into, a, uh, into an audio comedy series. Um, and we went through quite a lot of conversations about it and there were a couple of times. Someone else actually did the first adaptation, the first episode, and Douglas absolutely exploded because he was unhappy right. with it. And, and it, the fact that I was with Douglas and I, I got a very real sense of what... what f what would float with him and what would sink. And I've carried that ever since, even though it then took 12 years for us to finally do it. I always carry Douglas in my mind. And people have said, the reason I admire Owen for writing the book, because I think it was a poison chalice, whichever way you go, mm. as soon as you say, I'll do it. But who would turn it down? If somebody said to you, and you want to be, a, you know, and you're a professional writer. Would you write another hitchhiker book? Very hard thing to walk away from. Give us an example of something where you think it would sink. I wouldn't go there. Well, I personally wouldn't do with hitchhikers what has been done with Douglas's Dirk Gently, which is to take the premise and then spin off a bunch of stories. No matter how good they are, I couldn't do that because because I I know that Douglas was very very pernickety about what was done with his work and as a for instance when another writer wrote a pilot for the third series Douglas rang me and said come round at once and I went round and he was Jane his wife showed me in and I went down to the basement and he was bashing away furiously on this little Apple laptop and I said are you okay he said I'm writing I'm writing how it should be not how this person has done it this person who shall remain nameless had put a talking dinosaur uh, Arthur had a pet talking dinosaur in prehistoric Earth, and, di and Douglas, a talking dinosaur is scientifically impossible, historically inaccurate, <laughs> anach anach anachronistically ghastly. I mean, he was just incandescent with rage. He found, so, he found writing extraordinarily challenging for radio, didn't he? Yeah. But then I think he found writing challenging anyway, but if you adapt the work, this is the... I mean, the, the joy of doing what I do is that you, when you disassemble a novel, working with Douglas or indeed with Neil Gaiman, you know, when you disassemble a piece of work, you, work, you find out where the hidden joints are. You mm. find out where the, the carpentry is that, that deceives the eye and the final thing. And when you work with Douglas's material, it just gets more densely layered. The more you separate out, the more you find beneath. And 
he found writing hard because, as uh, Simon Jones uh, tells a story about when Jeffrey Perkins, Jeffrey, who produced the, most of the first series and all of the second series, Jeffrey discovered the best thing was never to ask Douglas for a rewrite because if you had six pages you want rewritten, Douglas took two hours and came back with one. Mm. And that perfectionism was I was a hearing challenge. John Lloyd last week saying with the book, he would take months on the first paragraph and then it would be absolute chaos to finish the rest. You, you can chime with that. And he'd throw that first paragraph away. The, the, the Life, the Universe, Anything, there's, there's an actual paragraph before the first paragraph in that book where Douglas goes from the, the sort of theory of everything right down to a human screaming in a cave, and that's Arthur. And the book actually starts with the scream, but there's actually a chapter's worth of build-up to that where he takes everything from the Big Bang right down to this one scream. It's fascinating. Now, it's interesting you use the phrase, the theory of everything, because obviously today is an extraordinarily poignant day uh, with the death of Stephen Hawking. And, of course, he was a special guest on the series that's just going out now. So let's hear Steve, Stephen Hawking in this clip. Careful, Ford. I'm just poking the wall. It ripples. Please don't do that. Who's that? I can't materialize. I haven't got the power. So, disembodied thing, you're saying that this whole room is a construct? Please don't poke the walls like that. This waiting lounge is all in your head. It is a virtual room. A virtual room? Is there another way you would like me to impart this information? I was merely asking. He does ask questions. Who are you? I am the Hitchhiker's Guide of the Galaxy. Mark II. You're the bird? Yes. My functionality is impaired. You knew me as the bird. You sound like prof- Others knew me in different forms. I have been quite popular in my time. Some even read my books. But listen, I can't hold this waiting lounge together for much longer. <laughs> Strongly poignant to hear that today. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> Stephen Hawking genuinely a very big fan of Hitchhikers. It's so it seems, yes. He, <laughs> he was really keen to do it. And what's interesting is, what's nice about... Owen wrote the part. I mean, that voice that Stephen was using is, you know, is not Stephen's voice. Of course. Um, and yet the, the way the scene is written is that this creation, this guide mark II, is actually sorry it did what it did to these people. It's actually, it's, it, there's regret. And in the weirdest way, I'm hearing regret in the voice, in Stephen's artificial voice. And, and it's, it's a complete thrill. So there's one extraordinary figure from the last 12 months, obviously Stephen. And then Elon Musk yeah. gets connected with the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The rocket goes up, the telescope is there. Inside the glove compartment, a copy of the it's guide. It's a copy of the book. And on accounts. the front of the car, don't panic. Don't panic on the dashboard. <laughs> Just amazing. And this thing is going to be orbiting the sun for the next three billion years. And when this, this planet has been reduced to dust by all the idiots who run it, this, some alien is going to come along and find this car going around and wonder what the hell was that about. But it's, <laughs> Douglas must be loving that. He may be watching it. I hope going he past. is. I hope he is. So it's esoteric. It's unbelievably creative, obviously. There's these extraordinary characters... And there's these phrases that have literally become part of everyday life, life, the universe and everything, 42, don't panic. I even heard today, drink up, the world's about to end. My God, right. They are amazing examples, aren't they, of how something <coughs> becomes more than just a drama series or a comedy series. It becomes part of UK it, life. It's part of our the soul of... Well, you say UK life, but it's around the world. I mean, you know, there's a huge uh, hitchhiker hiker fan uh, membership in, in America. I mean, Elon Musk is South African, you know, yeah. lives in California. This is a worldwide thing. And uh, people say, oh, you know, will it last? And I, I saw a rather upsetting thing where somebody was doing a talk about Douglas and uh, he had a room of 30 people and only three of them knew who Douglas was. And that's kind of why... Because there are other people who say 
oh, you know, the sixth series, you know, it doesn't have Peter Jones, it doesn't have uh, Richard Vernon as Slarty, all of this stuff. And I'm saying, yeah, but for as long as the vast majority of us are A, still alive, B, in some way we're involved in it by Douglas asking us, and C, there is this one last opportunity to put Douglas's unpublished work out there. It's almost our duty to do it, if nothing else, to uh, try and attract more people to Douglas's work, because that's really the object of the exercise. But the interesting thing for me, Dirk, is that uh, at the weekend, I have a, 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 an eldest boy you know, Sam, lives in um, Tokyo, uh, a younger boy, uh, 23, 24, Harry. When I said I was going to be talking to you, they said, oh, Hitchhikers, I've read all the three books, I've read all the books, listened to the radio series. So that moving on generation to generation, you think will be there for Hitchhikers, do you? I hope so. I really do. I hope it's there in, and in a way where it doesn't turn into something that it never was. I would like it to always be connected to Douglas. Let's move from Douglas and Hitchhikers and focus on you. Your art. Must we? <laughs> well, that's why we're here, Dave. Oh, yeah. uh, I want to talk about your art, your skill, your creativity. You're obviously a prolific writer and director of what some call audio drama, some call comedy, and some call audio movies, audio theatre. How would you describe your work? I honestly have run out of expressions. Uh, podcasts is the new one. When I'm dealing with American people, they're asking me, so you do podcasts? And I say, I th oh, I thought it was a radio comedy or I thought it was a drama or audio theatre. Um, what I... My production style has been to try and make something that is as immersive as a film without the visual element, but takes you in... And what I say when I'm talking to students about sound production, sound design and, and audio production is you, you, you don't need a visual image to create an image. If it can bypass the optic nerve, you can go in the side door and you can still paint a picture on the brain. And that is the beauty. The, the, the old joke about radio drama is that the scenery is better on radio. <laughs> but really, in truth, what you can do is allow people to keep their... Uh, preconceptions of, for example, in The Lord of the Rings, there was a very successful production at the end of the uh, 70s by um, uh, Jane, I've forgotten her other name, forgive me, um, but a very, very good BBC drama version of The Lord of the Rings. And if you knew the books, it was very faithful, and Brian, Brian Sibley did the adaptation, very faithful to the books, but the characters just came to life. It was beautifully cast. Mm. And I think if you can cast something in the right way, and you can add layers of sound effects from... You can create a world inside which people exist. And that's really my, my big thing, is that if I'm listening to radio drama, I know those people are standing in a studio, and it sounds the same wherever they are. They go outdoors, and they add birds tweeting, and I can still hear it there in the studio. I'm going crazy, because when I decided to get into this, when I, when I thought this is something worth getting into, the one thing I wanted to do was not make it sound like a radio drama, I wanted it to sound like a movie, because I think movies, films, are they are the grammar by which a lot of what we understand to be storytelling takes place these days. And when I was in Radio Light Entertainment in the late 80s, early 90s, I would go for what I would call a popcorn lunch, I would tell my PA to tell everyone who needed me I was down at Lower Regent Street Cinema and I would watch Terminator 2 or Thelma and Louise and I was watching these films with my eyes but I was listening with my ears and when we were allowed to do the DC comic stuff that I think we'll talk about, I wanted to make the audio sound like a film because I thought, well, they're doing all the... Th they're just using the technology to create a more realistic world for the ears. Why can't we do that without the pictures? So... We first meet each other in the early 90s, 1990, 91. And it is fair to say, um, within the BBC, Dirk then, his reputation for ambition, originality, breaking new ground where no one had been before, was incredible, 
was incredible. All around those DC Marvel comics and uh, Batman, Superman. Let's hear a clip. This one comes now from Superman. What are you saying? Basically, Clark Kent is Superman. Hold up! A hostage situation is one thing. A hostage situation in a nuclear power plant is something else. Superman, if you're watching this, if you're still alive, please save us. Save Metropolis. Clark Kent is Superman? Clark Kent. Anna. Help me. This body will never wear out. Not so long as it's powered by my kryptonite art. Kryptonite. It hurts. Amazing. I mean, I remember then, Dirk, in the 90s, um, some of this work on Radio 1, front covers of Radio Times, and they were seen as absolutely groundbreaking at that time. And when I hear it now, the sophistication, the complexity of the layering... Just how challenging is that to make? Well, I would say that was all done on quarter-inch tape. We, uh, you know, which uh, digits now, it makes me laugh hearing this in the nicest way. I'm, I, all I hear is what's wrong with it. But at the same time, I'm also thinking, holy smoke, how on earth did we do that? And I do remember when I was with Wilfredo Acosta and Ian Harker, who were kind of my partners in crime, and then a studio manager called Tim Sturgeon. They were all these studio managers who were friends. And I went in one day and I said, right, we're doing Superman and we've got to make it sound like a film. And they said, well, that's going to be tricky. And I said, why is that? And they said, because these sound desks don't allow you to pull up all these bottom frequencies and do all these top frequencies. They, they made it, the engineers didn't like studio managers to be able to mess up what the transmitters could take. You didn't want to trip out Daventry. That was bad news. <laughs> so um, it was really uh, a challenge. And we would go in and, you know, this week... Right, we've got to do Superman taking off. How are we going to do that? Okay, well, we find some wind effects, and we get the old wind machine out of the props department, and it sounds like 1942, and think, no, no, that won't do. So I got a SM58 mic, and I just went, like that. And I won't do it on this mic, but it, oh, that's not bad. Let's do that then. And then he had to land. So one of us stood on a chair, and then got the, got the coat, and then we sort of jumped off the chair and went, on the way down with the coat. Oh, that'll do for landing. And it was all this kind of wonderful Heath Robinson stuff, and I miss those days. I'm doing Hitchhiker's Hexagonal on about 48 tracks, and I'm thinking, oh, what happened to the days of jumping off chairs with a whack, f flapping a coat? But you became a, a champion for surround sound. Yes. And Dolby, all that. Tell us about that. You, you saw the opportunity and the, um, oh, the well, skill I, of the technology. Yes, well, I can tell you exactly what happened there. Is Douglas wanted to do it. Douglas, we were talking about doing the, the third series, and Douglas said, I'd really like it to sound like a film, and, and that's why I've asked you to be here. And I said, great. And he said, what could we do to make it sound like a film? And I said, well, we could do it in surround sound. In, and this was in my ignorance. And, um, and he said, um, great, let's do that then. And I'm thinking, OK. And I'm walking up thinking... How do we do that? How do we do that? And then I went to see, we had a meeting, Jonathan James Moore, my boss, and I went to see the, te te tele uh, the technician guys, the radio technician guys, and I said surround sound and all these blokes, you know, with a cardigan and slippers, the old broadcasting house types, oh yeah, what do you want to do, lead? And, um, <laughs> and, they, uh, and this, this bloke says, um, I'll have to get back to you on that. <laughs> and um, I saw him a few days later, on going down Lower Regent Street, and he was coming up there, and he crossed the road rather than talk to me. Ah, this could be tricky. But that was the point at which I thought, I'm not going to do it in the house. I'm going to have to go elsewhere. And this is where I found a really great studio called The Sound House uh, with a guy called Paul Dealey, who you actually saw in the video earlier, who became my kind of brother in arms. And, um, and Dealey was willing to give it a go. They'd done a little bit of surround stuff, so we did it. And I have to say, 
one of my fondest memories of Dealey was when we did the Adventures of Superman, which was, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, Superman, Doomsday and Beyond, which was the death of Superman story. We did that for the, that was my first digital job. And we were doing it on Pro Tools, which is an audio editing system, which nowadays is entirely reliable, but in the early 90s was a blooming nightmare. And I do remember every 20 minutes, you know, you add one more sound effect and the whole thing crashes. <laughs> and we were at four o'clock in the morning and I'm sitting there listening to the mix and suddenly something happens, it crashes and nothing happens. And I look up and poor old Dealey's just fallen asleep <laughs> on the desk like that. But it was that pursuit of trying to make it different. And, and we ended up doing that Superman thing because Hitchhiker stalled at that point. But it was Douglas who actually started that. I mean, Joy gave some wonderful um, descriptions of your career. I, I read one last week, which keep forever, Dirk, which is the S Steven Spielberg of audio. I thought, <laughs> what an absolutely <laughs> terrific <laughs> description of you. And when you look at uh, The X-Files uh, with Gillian Anderson. You've and been, David. And David Duchovny. You've been with... And on, Mitch. On Alien. Yes. You've uh, obviously worked with Neil Gaiman. Yeah. Who? Fantastic. <laughs> Stardust. Uh, I thought we'd just hear a clip now. This is Neil Gaiman and Neverwhere. It's moving away. It's going. Give me the spear. No, 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 it's leaving. You think it's leaving? It's making room. Making room for what? For a charge. There it is! Look at all those weapons buried in its flanks. Give it a bloody spear, man! Come on, you bastard! Oh, God! Are you scared? Come on, Hunter! That's the size of an elephant! Come on, Hunter! In my dream, in my dream, it almost rears before it strikes. That's it! Use the angle! No! Hold the spear down! With the point up! Yes! No, Richard! Come on! Strike! Come on! Under! Fantastic. <laughs> that was not made in one minute, Dirk, I can tell that. <laughs> I mean, working with Neil Gaiman, tell us about that. Uh, well, it helps that he's alive. <laughs> that is a big... I find it having a writer who you can actually email and say, um, did you mean so-and-so, is wonderful. Uh, Neil is fantastic. In fact, Neil and I met through... It's strange, we're both actually... We were both mentored by Douglas... Douglas heard my radio work and wanted to, to work with me, and Douglas read Neil's writing and wanted to work with him, and actually one of Neil's first jobs was writing a sort of early biography of Douglas and Hitchhikers called Don't Panic, which is actually one of the better, one of the best Douglas books there is out there. It's written as if, like, Douglas. Right. But Neil is, he's, he's, you know, he has a huge career in, in sort of fiction, and, but he was writing a, a, com a comic book series called The Sandman for DC Comics at the time, and we were kind of introduced by a mutual friend at DC, and Neil is um, just a thoroughly good guy. He's one of life's absolute gentlemen. He's hugely talented, um, and yet you can talk to him as if, you know, over the garden fence. He's, he's one of the best, and it's a thrill to work with him. So tonight... Britain and the world mourns the passing of Stephen Hawking. And 15 months ago, we both remember very clearly that the world was mourning the passing of David Bowie. Mm. And by chance, I picked up this extraordinary piece you did earlier in the year for the BBC World Service, which is taking Bowie and Tony Visconti in the studio as he puts the final touches to Black Star with John Coleshaw in a serious role of David Bowie. An extraordinary piece of work, Dirk. Let's hear this. Tony, Anthony, old boy. Can you hear me? Anthony Visconti. He can't hear me. Either that or he's ignoring me. Maybe the talkback's not working. 
David, sorry. <laughs> Were you trying to say something? <laughs> I was saying something. Uh, the talk back monitor was off. Yeah, I just wanted to hear that last tape before I have a go at the next one. Sure. Here you go. I'll tell you what, Tony, I think we've got to drop this into iTunes, you know, totally unannounced. Um, just like we did with Where Are We Now? As long as there's me, as long as there's you. You know, I think that kind of feeling almost of, um, as if secrets being slowly revealed over time. You know, I think a lot of that feeling will be just right for this word too. Mm. I love that, Dirk, because you're so well known for the DC comics. You're known for Hitchhikers. But in that, you show, again, extraordinary sympathy and integrity for Bowie himself. Did you feel that a challenge again? You try and create... You, you try and immerse the listener in the world that the subject is in and that's the same whether you're on the bridge of the heart of gold or you're in uh, the studio in New York where Bowie did Black Star you what you want to do is create a moment where you create a stillness you create it create it, it inhabits its own space and you are in that space with the protagonists or protagonist in this case and it's just holding that magic together. And uh, I have to say, David Morley, who wrote the script for that, based on Bowie's own writings, did a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. But the thing about John was that we, I've tried to get him into things previously, and people were telling me, no, no, he's a comedian. And I'm saying, no, 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 comedians often make the best straight actors because they know, like drummers, where to drop the bombs. Mm. And that's why John was so good. That's why Ken Dodd, the late lamented, played a brilliant Malvolio once in Twelfth Night. Because comedians have that sense of where to put things. It's, it all comes down to timing. So when we arrived tonight, Dirk, we came on the stage and Steve, the technician, was with you. And I noticed you said, oh yeah, this was the stage. And he said, no, the stage was over there. Actually, the stage was higher because mm. it was a trap door. And here was below the stage. Yeah. And you were getting incredibly emotional about it, about your time here at the John Stripe and your time at the King Alfred College. What do you remember about those times? Beer. A lot. <laughs> a lot of beer. I remember Ada and, Ada and Tree he used to run the, run the bar up in the, uh, up in the Union, which was the, the, the laterally... It's not the Union where it is now. Our Union... Adrian Tree used to make fine sandwiches and pull pints. No, I, I remember a lot. I had the best time ever at what was King Alfred's and now is the University of Winchester. And I'm, I, I do find it, it's kind of strange coming back. It's wonderful to come back and see how the place has just blossomed. And at the same time, it's kind of painful because I do remember this slightly, you know, intimate feel where there was only 900 students, you know. It was like crazy. Everybody knew everybody else which could be a problem. Uh, <laughs> but um, what was great was when I arrived here in 1974, I walked through the side door there. I went to the Bob Sylvester's office to audition with my audition piece, which was Andrew Marvell's To His Coy Mistress, which I thought was about right. A little bit naughty, but it was also classic. I thought that was about right pitch. He let me in. And I came... I had a look around, and there was a, a wardrobe department upstairs here where Adele Hallen used to start the costumes, and there was lots of flats st stored in the backstage area here, and there was an actual living theater, and there was the auditorium. And to me, it was like, it was like the biggest, best box of Lego possible. And for the four years I was here, because I was doing a degree course, which was an extra year, I just tried to take advantage of all the facilities the college had to offer, the TV studio in the basement, the Tom Atkinson building we had there. And I do remember one time, my friend Ian Fraser and I, Ian, who, who was with Wessex Educational Television that were based in the Tom Atkinson building, but later on became theatre technician here. But Ian, Ian and I were, had been like brothers for years and years and years. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if the student union had a weekly television programme 
where you did, and we could do like news and stuff. And we went to, we were really full of this idea. I think we'd have several beers in the union by then. Uh, probably one lunchtime. And went down to the AV and we spoke to the gentleman who was in charge of AV at the time, whose name shall remain anonymous. And we said, we could do this. We could pump the programs. We could make the program in television studio and do it direct up a coaxial cable to the union. And, and, and we could do it every Thursday after Top of the Pops because that's when everybody's in there watching the telly. <laughs> And, and it would be really good. And the bloke said, and he looked, look at the state of me. I mean, you wouldn't give me a, you know, a job. And he said, mm, well, let's face it, nobody would watch it. And that was it. And so we thought, well, blow you then. And in those days, up at Crawley, the independent television corporation had their laboratories. And so Ian said, we'll go to Crawley. We'll get our own cable. <laughs> and so we drove up to Crawley and went in there and went to see one of the technicians and said, could you spare three or four hundred metres of coaxial cable? He said, <laughs> and he said yeah, probably. <laughs> and he got some. So we came back. And, and so we, in dead of night, we strung a cable between the top of the Tom Atkinson building and the Union building. And that Thursday, we put on the first um, uh, episode of Televine, our, our, our student TV service, and the Union was full. And not long afterwards, Televine was carrying all sorts of really exciting... <laughs> and you'll like this. We found out that you could use college toast and scrambled eggs to make a nuclear shelter for Action Man. <laughs> That's... <laughs> so, just hearing that then, Dirk, there's a student in the audience tonight who's the same age as you were then. They're at the University of Winchester. They're either doing drama or performance. What's your advice? Well, <laughs> why aren't you in the pub would be my first. <laughs> but, <laughs> but secondly, no, my, my advice is you will never get the opportunities again in your life for nothing that you've got in this establishment. You will never get the access to the facilities, access to the expertise. You will never be able to just turn around and there's someone who either shares your interest or can talk to you about your interest, or can give you a little bit of sensible advice, just literally within a few yards walk, and use all the facilities that the university provides, because that really is. Um, th that's the, the, the point about being here. There was, a, there was a promotional video for the university on Facebook the other week, and I saw somebody say, well, oh, it's all about, all about being friends with people and having fun. It's not about the work. And I just said, but that's the point. The point is university isn't just an academic experience. It's, an, it's a whole holistic, Douglas, a whole holistic experience that involves not just your interests and your intellect, but also your activities and the developing of your skills. And so I would say to anybody here, just use the facilities, use the people you've got around you, create. If you're creative, create. And in a line, Dirk, as we come to the end of you and me talking, is the one thing you still want to do that you haven't done? Uh, yeah. There is, there's one project I've been trying to do for about 25 years that I would really, really like to do, and I can't talk about it, but it might just happen <laughs> because of everything that's brought me to this point. And, and at the end of the day, I did learn patience here. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we've all enjoyed the conversation, I hope. There is one special guest coming tonight as well to see us. Here he comes. Marvin from the stage show. Uh, we know there's a television Marvin, but we needed a Marvin who could uh, uh, join the cast on the tours uh, because Stephen Moore had very unwisely signed up for a year of touring in Oliver. 
And so uh, we uh, had to think very quickly. Um, and I remember Stephen rang me while we were queuing for the ferry to go on holiday, saying, I can't do it. And by the time we got to the cabin, uh, I'd worked out that if we could build some kind of puppet, maybe we could actually get uh, Stephen to still perform the part. And so uh, Stephen pre-recorded these lines um, at home, as you saw in the video earlier. And we had this puppet built. And what I asked Rob Allsop, who makes a lot of props and robots and stuff at Doctor Who, uh, built, the, uh, built this puppet, which my son Tom here is operating. And, um, and the puppet is... Uh, I said, what we want is something that would look like if you were trapped in a radio studio in 1978 for a week <laughs> and you had to build an artificial life form, what would you come up with? So if you, if you look, Marvin's wearing... He's got Rycote slippers. He's got a British, uh, BBC AXBT um, uh, lower legs. His upper legs are a sort of RCA, uh, slightly uh, messed up microphone. His body is a Brunel tape recorder, an old British tape recorder from way back when. And um, his arms are sort of strange, um, uh, slightly surer SM58 microphones and a couple of smaller mics for his shoulders. And his head is an old, well, kind of a Philips radio, I would say. <laughs> and then with the special electronics that, uh, that were brought in by, by uh, Rob and his people, um, he can also talk. Uh, Here I am, brainless side of a planet, with this pain in all the diodes on my left-hand side. Right. And um, uh, much to the disgust of the touring cast of the touring show, all of whom had been involved with Hitchhiker since the beginning, he was the one who got the standing ovation. <laughs> <out there>. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Dirk. He's certainly better looking than you, isn't he? Thanks, Sir yeah. yeah. OK, we'll have two quick questions from the floor, and then we'll come to a close. Who'd like to ask Dirk a question... It is a lady in the back there, yes. Can you shout? Yes. Oh, oh yeah, get the mic. Thank you. Um, Dirk, I was the lady that spoke to you out in the bar, the drama teacher. Um, I went to a production of, uh, a theatrical production of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. In fact, I have a badge saying don't panic that I bought there. Hope it's worth millions now. Um, and it was done by Theatre Cluid in Mould, and it was in three acts and they served pan-galactic goggle blasters in the uh, interval. <laughs> and we had uh, burgers, I can't remember, what the, that had purple mayonnaise, etc. Um, were you involved in that at all? Uh, sadly not. Oh. Sadly not. No. <laughs> because no. Ken Campbell did one, didn't he? He did. Ken, yeah. Ken did a production where the audience were on a hovercraft <laughs> in the, in the, in the theatre. Um, the problem was that the audiences were around the block for the show, but the hovercraft only took uh, something like 28 people, <laughs> uh, which proved a bit of a problem. So it didn't last very long. But no, I, I was involved with neither of those. But my, but my, my sort of claim to authenticity is that I did have Simon and Jeff and Sue and Mark, and we did have the original cast. So what we lacked in pangalactic gargle blasters, we made up for in um, original cast. Do we have one more gentleman here? And then I'll take you with the hat on at the end, and then we'll close. Sir, as somebody heavily involved in training teachers here at the university, I'm just wondering what sort of teacher we missed by you not going into Good teaching. <laughs> what, what would you have been like? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I, I actually do lecture now uh, on sound design and audio production, so I expect I would have made a go of it. I think I would have been the drama teacher who tried to put on the biggest, most outrageously, uh, sort of gloriously overpriced uh, show at the end of each term and, and, you know, probably was uh, making up for all sorts of things by doing so. I think schools escaped an awful fate by <laughs> me not doing that. And the gentleman with the uh, peak cap on. Good evening, Dirk. Good evening, Andrew. Um, just... Uh, I, I grew up in the 1970s uh, without a TV in the house. So radio was kind of my entertainment lifeline. So I, it was interesting you mentioned the production that Brian Sibley did of Lord of the Rings. So shows like that, Hitchhikers obviously kind of were, were my entertainment. So it was obviously that comedy and drama on radio was very popular at that time. And then it seemed to wane um, slightly. But now it seems to be 
back and really popular again. Now, why do you think that is? Is it the delivery systems? Is it oh, things like the internet? Yeah. Um, and also, I guess, just to ratchet, wrap it up, what, what do you really think is the appeal of radio comedy and audio drama, if that's what we're calling it, as opposed to television and film? Uh, that's, a, uh, that's an excellent question, Andrew, and I will give you the fiver after the uh, <laughs> presentation. Um, something amazing has happened in the last 10 years. 25 years ago, when we were making, when I started doing the Supermans and things like that, I went to BBC Worldwide to try and persuade them to put it out on cassette, which they eventually did. But my argument to them was, if you put enough promotional effort behind this, it could actually be what people are listening to on their Walkmans, which is what we had at the time, on the tube. And they didn't laugh in my face, but there was a definite sense of, well, actually, we're not going to be doing that. It'll be bought by the usual audience for this sort of thing. However, wind, uh, wind forward 15 years to the middle of the last decade, and I was telling my wife, after one particularly bleak year, that perhaps a job at home base might be, um, <laughs> might be a good idea. I quite fancied using that jiggly paint machine. And... Uh, then wind on to now, or rather last year, where suddenly the American market, because of the advent of smartphones and of the internet, and Americans are now listening to audio drama, or what they call podcasts, uh, in their cars and on the tubes and on the subways and on the elevated railways and all of that. And suddenly something I never thought, I gave up hoping would happen, has suddenly happened in such a way that I was actually flown out to San Diego Comic Con last year to do a panel with David Duchovny about the X-Files because it was such a big success, yeah. which is indicative of the fact that actually an art form that could have been lost has actually been saved by digital technology. So for all the people who complain about people who are riveted to their smartphones, I would say a lot of those people might just be selecting the next little bit of audio loveliness to lose themselves in on their boring commute to work. And I think that's a, that's a wonderful thing to, 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 to think of. Well, it's bang on eight o'clock. Um, it's been a great privilege, Dirk, as well as a pleasure to have this chat with you. Um, may I say before I ask Liz to give the final word as a governor of the university, what an incredibly proud night to have a guy that literally has broken barriers and made such a sensational creative contribution to radio, to audio, and to artistic endeavour. I leave the final words with the first Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Liz Stewart. Ladies and gentlemen, what a fantastic evening. And on your behalf, first thanks to Mark, uh, for a masterly interview. Uh, Mark has a book out shortly. Uh, <laughs> fantastic book on the Annunciation. Uh, so that's him paid for the night. <laughs> um, I can't believe it was 40 years ago when I used to time my bath to coincide with the broadcast of well Hitchhiker's done, Guide to the oh, Galaxy. So I kind of associated in my mind with being naked. <laughs> <laughs> but it actually had a profound effect on me because uh, the dish of the day turned me vegetarian. Ah, <laughs> there you go. Like Mark, um, I'm incredibly proud that this institution has produced somebody like Dirk Maggs. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a truth universally acknowledged that Dirk Maggs is a genius. Oh. Thank you. Thank you.